welcome everybody to our discussion series, Democracy in Times of Corona. Uh, as most of you know, I believe that uh, we have been uh, monitoring how democracies have been affected by the coronavirus. Um, we're collecting the measures that have been taken on a platform. Uh, we've been meeting regularly in discussion rounds and we have been interviewing activists and experts around the world. Uh, and one question that we've seen come to the forefront is really um, how to handle elections in a time in times of crisis, uh, in this case, a healthcare crisis. Um, and today we're very happy to have some speakers here uh, who will present how this question has been tackled in different countries, uh, in France, in the UK, in the German state of North Rhine-Westphalia and in the US. Uh, and of course, we would like to invite all of you who joined um, to also um, share perspectives from your countries. Um, so this round will be facilitated by Dr. Raban Furman of the Academy for Learning Democracy. Uh, so Raban, I will let you say a couple of words and then uh, we can uh, get started with our discussion round. Yes, thank you, Caroline. Welcome all. And yes, normally we make a, sh a short briefing at the beginning, but um, since the last um, meeting of this International Democracy Jam, we decided that we will focus on a, on a specific topic, and um, this time will be about elections. And um, yes, we want to, to share like what are our concerns maybe also. I think we have to be very, how say, observant and maybe even cautious about what is going on. And so the idea is really that we um, share ideas. We will have like a, like a lineup of um, several people here in this, in this meeting room who will give an insight about situations and questions in the country. And what I would propose is, um, if you have, um, while, while hearing or seeing, if some, some questions or maybe even better in collecting, um, I'll say, points of, of or critical points where we should focus more our attention, then you can write it down in the, in the chat. So when we start then the, the discussion, and we can, you know, take a look at what are like the, the central critical points uh, um, where we should focus on. And um, because surely our you know, forces, um, you know, we cannot focus on everything and we have to, to focus our forces and our energy. And so this idea of this kind of exchange, not only to be more aware of what is going on in other countries, but also in, in trying to to learn from each other, to, to, to maybe even to cooperate a little bit and, and to set a common agenda. Um, and so please, if you have ideas, write it down in the chat. We will have now the line up. Caroline will facilitate this because she knows best uh, the people who will be um, giving the insight about the situation in the country. And after this, maybe half an hour, um, you know, going through the different situations, we will then have a, a discussion and at the end that would be a great idea to have some kind of conclusion wrapping up what are like the most important critical points and um, where we have really to be very cautious and, and observant okay welcome and caroline it's you Great, thank you. Yes, um, so as Raban mentioned, we would like to start with a short input uh, from some speakers that we have invited um, on the situation in their countries, especially uh, pertaining to elections during this healthcare crisis. Um, and I would, I would like to ask the speakers to, um, to be brief so that we have enough time for a, for a really good discussion afterwards. Um, and just a couple of technical things that we have to mention every time before we started. Um, all of the participants are automatically muted. Um, but you can unmute yourself at any time. Um, and if you want, like, would like to ask a question or make a contribution, um, you can either raise your hand in real life or use the, um, the possibility that Zoom offers, which is in the participants window, where you can electronically raise your hand, um, or you can uh, write your question in the chat physically. Um, and um, from the inputs and the discussion, as Raman has mentioned, we would like to come up with a list of challenges and critical points um, to ensure democratic elections, even in a crisis. Uh, so please feel free to write any ideas you have on that in the chat. We will make a summary of that and, um, and send that to all of you. 
Um, so then now, I, I would like to welcome our speakers. Uh, we have with us uh, Achim Wölfel of Mehr Demokratie Nordrhein-Westfalia, Matt Fortrup, who is a professor in political science and international relations at Coventry University, Clara Egger, and uh, I'm not sure if Raoul is here, maybe just Clara, um, um, who's an assistant professor at the Rijksuniversiteit Groningen, um, and Nancy Wang, who's the executive director of Voters Not Politicians. Um, and I think, uh, Nancy, we will start with you because I believe you have to leave us a little bit earlier today. Um, we are very happy to have you here, uh, even though you have so little time. Um, to talk to us a little bit about the upcoming presidential elections in the US and the question of voting by mail, which has become the subject of a media storm last week after a tweet from uh, President Trump. So Nancy, could you tell us a little bit about your campaign and the challenges that the upcoming election poses given the crisis? Sure, uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Nancy Wang. I'm the uh, executive director of Voters Not Politicians and in Michigan. Uh, and we are a grassroots campaign. We formed in 2016 uh, just a bunch of regular voters who really wanted to um, take back our election processes so that we could elect uh, politicians that really uh, work for our interests instead of special interests. And we were able to uh, put a measure on our in our constitution that uh, ended gerrymandering so that the people could draw fair districts. And that was just one uh, step towards making our elections um, fair. And, uh, and the, you know, the, the next um, step that we saw this year was because of COVID. Um, COVID here, especially in Michigan, we have uh, the third highest deaths in the nation. And it's really disproportionately affecting our black and brown communities. And in Michigan, because of another reform effort in 2018, um, all Michiganders now have the constitutional right to vote by mail. But to do that, you have to submit, it's like a two-step process. You have to submit an application to the state. And then from then on, the state will mail you uh, ballots in your mailbox. Um, we have seven and a half million voters in Michigan. And as of our last uh, election that we had in May, uh, only about 1.3 million Michiganders had signed up for vote by mail. And so what we've been trying to do is really push our legislature because we need our legislature to pass new laws to, to just, you know, eliminate that middle step so that people don't have to apply. They can just automatically get the mail um, ballot, especially for this year. We saw that, you know, that was uh, particularly an urgent need to protect the health and safety of our voters. And again, especially the ones that uh, members of our community that are less likely to return the application, but then are more likely to suffer, um, you know, extreme um, serious consequences from COVID in inspect uh, infections. So, and then of course, in the last few days, we have seen in the U.S. and um, all internationally um, that you know there have been massive demonstrations against police police brutality and um, against the the. It, really extreme um, levels of inequality that we have uh, in the cities in this country. And we're, you know, it's, it's not, it only takes one step to kind of link that back to the fact that politicians are not, they're not acting in the interests of our people. Um, and we really need to get people, as many people as possible, uh, as much access as possible to our elections. And so we see vote by mail as a way to, you know, bring more people uh, into uh, the elections process and to remove barriers that honestly the system has constructed um, around people, um, you know, to, to kind of disenfranchise them. So that's where we are and we're really trying um, hard both in Michigan and across the country. Um, you'll read in the newspapers about groups like ours that are just fighting to increase access to the ballot um, for all people in, in the, in the uh, time of COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that for that introduction. Um, given that you have to leave a little bit earlier, um, I would offer the opportunity uh, to participants to ask uh, some questions now, if that is OK. Um, is there anybody who would like to um, pose a question? I see Matt Kvortrup. Please go ahead. Just just a minute. You are still on mute. You have to turn on. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm I'm here. Uh, so thank you for that. That was uh, the very interesting. Uh, of course, we're following America 
uh, with uh, with interest and sometimes alarm. Uh, but I just wanted to a, a, a quick couple of questions, uh, if I may, about Michigan. So, is the legislature in uh, in Michigan is that controlled by the Democrats? In other words, are you likely to get the uh, the amendment through so you make it easier to to vote by mail? Um, and as, as I understand it from a, an outsider's perspective, uh, Trump is very much opposed to, to vote by mail. Do we have conclusive evidence that it would actually uh, benefit his opponent if he were to have uh, all male uh, elections? Yeah, so in Michigan, the legislature is actually both chambers, uh, the House and the Senate are controlled by Republicans. And the reason for that is because of gerrymandering, actually, because they drew the the Republicans were in charge of the legislature in 2010, uh, you know, during the last redistricting cycle, and they drew districts so that even though, you know, in in the last let's say four election cycles, more Democrats have won votes for both of the chambers than Republicans. Republicans have been able to hold on to their majority in both chambers. So we do not expect, unfortunately, a in part because of the rhetoric that we're hearing from Trump and the politicization just recently of vote by mail, we don't expect our legislature to pass uh, any laws to make vote by mail easier. But the role of our grassroots group is we have, you know, thousands of volunteers all throughout the state and we're going to, you know, get involved in elections to, to hold these politicians accountable. And, and your second uh, question about, you know, does this benefit one party or another? You know, the ironic thing is there's there's a bunch of studies that show, you know, that it doesn't benefit one party or another. And in fact, um, it might it might because of, you know, older people are, are more likely to vote by mail that it might actually if you expand vote by mail, it might uh, benefit older voters who tend to vote more Republican. OK, thank you very much. Is there anybody else who would like to ask a question? Um, I don't see all of you. Sorry. You. Yes, Clara, please go ahead. Well, I think I, I think Cesare was was first, but it's a very quick and information question. Usually, how many people uh, use a uh, vote by mail, like in normal time, uh, approximately? Just just to know how how it is used. Yeah, we have um, several states that have been using vote by mail uh, for decades, actually. And we've been talking some of the what we're trying to do is, is educate um, our lawmakers and our citizens about what vote by mail is. There's a lot of myths that honestly, unfortunately, have been spread now by, you know, Trump and other Republican lawmakers about the fact that it's not secure, the fact that your vote won't count. And all of those myths have been debunked by, you know, extensive research. Um, a lot of a lot of it coming out of these states that really have shown that vote by mail um, expands uh, voter uh, turnout, uh, increases voter turnout, um, that it is safe and secure, that people really like it, that it's convenient um, for people. And um, again, that it doesn't benefit, you know, one party or another. So that's just kind of our um, our task is a lot of um, educating people and making them more confident. Uh, that vote by mail, again, especially now, the reason why we jumped into this um, issue to begin with was really because we wanted to protect the public health, um, you know, and we want to make sure that our elections are not shut down because, uh, you know, people are afraid um, or that uh, politicians are using COVID as an excuse to, you know, uh, dismantle our democratic system, essentially. Mm -hmm. Uh, great, I believe Cesare had a question. Sorry, I can't see all of you at the same time, so um, it, 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 I might not have the order right when you raise your hand. Apologies. There you go. Uh, so I'm just going to read my question that I posted in the, uh, in the thread. Uh, Nancy, I'm helping to coordinate an international network of citizen assembly meetings. In our citizen assemblies, we use the most powerful political networking platform in the world. It's called Igora, the worldwide stock market of ideas. Igora enables everyone to develop their own political philosophy out of various ideas. It demonstrates which ideas are most strongly supported by the people. And then it creates new political candidates who actually represent the will of the people. Are you interested in joining us? 
Yeah, well, I'd be interested in certainly in learning more. You know, what we saw um, in our experience, and it's very exciting, is that, you know, people who had never been activists before, they have never, you know, been involved in any kind of political campaigns as a volunteer or otherwise, um, as soon as they joined and had this experience of really being able to make change um, in Michigan, they are now running for office for the first time. So I love the idea of people coming together and learning more and and connecting with each other and getting more involved in um, and, and feeling empowered, um, you know, to act together and potentially be political candidates or, or in, you know, in other ways. So um, I would love to connect and and to learn more about your organization. Thank you. Great. Uh, I think there's there's two more questions, uh, and I believe afterwards Nancy really has to go. <laughs> um, but we do have uh, our very own Daniela Vancic, uh, who knows the campaign very well, uh, and who's who's an American and who works for Democrats abroad, who can also answer questions uh, about the, the situation in the U.S. Um, so Raban, uh, I believe you had also raised your hand to ask a question. Go ahead. Yes. Um my question, um, Nancy, is um, generally my impression, I'm not very familiar with the American system, but at least, you know, what I get out of the news is that um, the things of getting re registered for voting um, is very complicated generally in the United States. So what, what is the reason um, why, you know, such an old and strong democracy um, gets so complicated when people try in certain sense, to, to use the power of voting. Is this really mistrust um, that, you know, someone could misuse this, or is it a political, you know, you, you were speaking about gerrymandering, um, or, or what, is the, what is the reason why it's generally so complicated, not only in this case now with, with, with mailing? Interesting. Uh, there are many reasons for that, but I hate to like plug ourselves, but there was a documentary crew that followed us in, you know, 2016 to 2018 uh, uh, in our campaign. The documentary is called Slay the Dragon, and it's widely available now on several platforms. Um, but it really does a great job of connecting all the dots to, you know, this all of this voter suppression this you know making it really hard for people to vote all of that is part of like this this very concerted and intentional uh campaign to make it harder for people to vote and it's it's exclusively um you know these policies are exclusively being uh you know put forward and passed uh, in states where the republicans um control the state houses um, and the reason for that is because, you know, you'll see in Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, a lot of these cases that are most affected by extreme gerrymandering, um, again, where, you know, politicians are able to hold on to power, um, even though they don't have a majority of the support of the voters. Um, it's, it's because they're losing the, the battle of ideas. And so what they do is they suppress the vote, but it's not suppressing the vote of everyone. It's really suppressing the vote of you know, communities of color, um, people who, um, if you if you pass a voter ID requirement, for example, a very strict voter ID requirement, that you know that only certain populations have a, a you know more difficulty getting that kind of ID. I.e., again, it's it's not surprising. It affects you know our communities in Detroit, people of color, people with less access in general to government services. And then you'll have, I mean, some of these measures are just, they're astounding, right? You see Georgia where they have an election and they shut down 80% of the, of the voting precincts in, you know, cities that are predominantly African-American. And that's just, again, it's just an intentional way of um, people holding on to power, you know, and, and it's really a recent phenomenon in terms of the, the modern American Republican Party really trying to suppress the vote so, so they can just hold on to power and, and use our political system to benefit their special interests. But for this, um, this the Supreme Court should be active. You know, that's why we have this checks and balances system. So what is the role then of the Supreme Courts in the states but on the, on the nation level? Why is it... <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, so that's, you know, theoretically you do have us checks and balances, but what's happening is there are forces that are 
working to undermine the different branches of government, right? So you have this legislature now in, on the federal uh, in the federal level where we have the U.S. Senate that's controlled by Republicans. We have the you know the House that re just recently was taken back by you know Democrats, but there was also for a while controlled by um, Republicans. And then you have Donald Trump. So unfortunately, it's only up to the Senate, the U.S. Senate, again controlled by Republicans. Um, that has the duty to confirm federal judges, okay, including Supreme Court judges. So when you have, you know, someone die or someone retire from the U.S. Supreme Court, which is, they're the ultimate arbiter. There's no one above them to, you know, reject or, or um, uh, uh, undo, like, their, you know, their opinions. Then what happens then is Trump puts forward, uh, you know, really, uh, judges that are at the extreme end of the spectrum, right? Ultra conservatives that, again, like don't represent the majority of um, people's uh, principles and opinions. And then the Senate confirms them for life. So right now we have a majority in our U.S. Supreme Court that is very conservative and they're not in step with how the majority of people feel, but we have no recourse when a, you know, a case comes up and the U.S. Supreme Court rules um, to allow corporations, for example, to spend unlimited money in U.S. political campaigns. Like that's actually the law now. And that is, was allowed by, it's because we have the U.S. Supreme Court hand down a decision that allows corporations to do that. And then there's nothing we can do about it. So there are no, you're, you're having this, this system that was supposed to be three co-equal branches, but that's really not how our system is functioning right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, probably the last <laughs> question Nancy has time for. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it, it's a topic that, that's on everybody's mind, I think, in the last couple of days. And um, we, we really hope um, that in a lot of states, um, we you can get um, um, voting by mail. Um, if there are any other burning questions on the, on the, uh, the US situation, I think um, Daniela can, um, can take over if you would be. I know at least for Donald's question, uh, Daniela has the answer to that as well. Thank you so much, Nancy. Sure, and feel free to get in touch with me. I would, you know, I would love to continue a conversation. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, real quick, how do we get a hold of you? I sent you a message with my email address. But oh, if great. Yeah, it's easy. You can just email nancy at votersnotpoliticians.com. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Thank you. Um, maybe, Daniela, would you, um, would you be willing to, to answer? Donald uh, posted a question in the, in the chat um, asking about the um, citizens who are uh, selected to, um, to draw up constituencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so the so Nancy is the executive producer of Voters Not Politicians. They started exactly because of gerrymandering, actually. This um, Vote Safe campaign is just now launched in the last couple months just because um, the elections are this year and it's really about getting safe voting then for November. And we saw what happened like in the primaries, people waiting in line in, uh, in Wisconsin, and then hundreds of people were infected after that, of course, because they're all in small, cramped voting spaces. Um, so um, about the actual independent drawing of constituencies, this was uh, a campaign that the, the organization Voters Not Politicians ran in 2018 before the uh, midterm elections, and that was um, actually a citizen's initiative. We have um, citizen's initiatives in Michigan also. So they collected signatures. Actually, how it really started, it was just a Facebook post, and someone, um, after the the, um, the election that brought us then Trump and um, brought us then Republicans across the board also in Michigan because of this gerrymandering redistricting district problem that we have um, just posted on Facebook who wants to tackle the issue of gerrymandering and redistricting in Michigan and then um, just a ton of people responded to that so they were able to get, um, get really a ton of volunteers and also some legal experts and to really look at the process of how then we would have to change the Michigan state constitution uh, an amendment to it and how that process looks. And since we have um, citizens initiatives in Michigan, so they started that process, signature collection. Um, I believe you need, and Nancy probably knows this, but um, you would need, I think, 4% um, uh, or so of the last voter turnout, of the last uh, um, gov governatorial, so when we voted for governor, 
So looking at voter turnout from the last uh, time around, and that was, I think that's about 4% or, or so, or 5% um, of that. And so they collected those signatures, they were successful in that. Um, and then, um, yeah, they, they were on the ballot in 2018 um, that I also, because I'm, I'm also from Michigan, so I also got to vote for that, so voted yes, <laughs> that was proposal number two. And um, now um, that passed, so they are right now, they just closed, it is, is, um, if I understood correctly, just yesterday or so, they just closed the application process for um, citizens, just regular citizens who want to be on this board of commission to redistrict the, um, the, the state of Michigan, basically. And they will look at that. I, th I think that's nine citizens who make up this commission. It will be four, um, three or four um, self-identified Democrats, three or four self-identified um, Republicans, and then the rest are yeah, uh, neutral or independents. Um, so they just closed that, that process yesterday for those who want to apply for that. They're going to take a look at it. Um, I believe that they will also use random selection for that also to, to find them and then they will run also um yeah interviews with them making sure that there i mean there's criteria that need to be followed for example nobody on this board of commissioners there nobody can have a connection to a sitting official nobody can have a politician in the family um so they they will start to draw that and by um I think next year they will begin to already redraw it. So then by the election after that, whatever comes in after next year, um, we will have new districts in Michigan. Great, thank you very much. Um, so then um, it's a, a little bit of an uh, unorthodox uh, discussion round now because uh, Nancy had to leave earlier, um, but it sort of works out because our next uh, three speakers um, are all talking about on the topic of municipal elections. Um, and so I would like to uh, invite Clara now, uh, who is very, uh, Clara Egger, who is very active in France and who has ver followed very closely uh, the developments of the municipal elections uh, in France, uh, the first round of which took place, the second round of which still uh, has, to, um, has to take place. Um, so Clara, please could you explain a little bit uh, what has happened and, and, and what the consequences of that have been? Yes, sure. Thanks a lot for having me um, having me participating. I'm, I'm sorry because Raul is having another call, so you may hear, well, strange noises, but I'm trying to uh, mitigate this. Well, um, I wanted first to give a bit of context because I don't know how, um, how much you know about the French political systems and, and the role of uh, municipal uh, elections uh, in, in that system. So, so they are held every six years. Um, and it's quite an important uh, event in France, even if, if cities don't have a lot of, of powers because of the really centralized uh, nature of, of the French uh, state. But still, uh, we have around 36,000 uh, mayors in, in France. Uh, so that's, that's a lot of people. I think, I'm not sure it's still, it is still valid, but in the past, um, we had more mayors in France than in all the countries in, in the EU. So it's, it's quite like, it's, it's quite something, right? And uh, mayors play a role at two levels. First, they elect the Senate, uh, which is uh, now due to a change of electoral calendar, one of the most uh, central check and balance uh, in, in the French political system. And they also do sponsor uh, candidates to the presidential election. So uh, if, if, for example, only mayors from big cities would be able to do that, we would have had in the past presidential election only five candidates. So mayors from small uh, villages, towns and cities, they have this power to appoint and support uh, candidates to the, to the presidential election. So that's a bit like to, to tell that it's, it's still an important election, even if the power uh, of the mayor is not that big. In terms of political context, as you uh, perhaps know, we had the, it was a difficult uh, political period, uh, political time in, in France, because um, the election were to take place after so the, the Yellow Vest movement, so it's, it's movement of, of consistation, having democracy has really as, as a central uh, demand and especially direct uh, democracy. But also it, 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 they were supposed to take place after a, a long uh, series of strikes uh, about the defense of French uh, uh, public services um, and in a context where uh, the government, uh, the parliament and the president had a, a support uh, rate, very, a very, very low one perhaps one of the of the lowest in, in, in Europe. So the situation was really like 
on the age of um, of um, of being uh, really um, really um, yeah I would say unstable. Um, during that that municipal election campaign, a lot of citizen lists uh, were proposed. A lot of people, you know, teaming up and joining with their neighbors to propose a list and tend to challenge the uh, incoming mayor and the incoming, uh, I would say, mainstream political parties. That was a bit um, the context before the, the election, which was supposed to take place on the 15th of March, so in the middle of the, of the corona uh, crisis. So uh, when the corona crisis started to become really big, I would say, in France, there was like a lot of questions about what to do with, with these elections. Should we continue with them? Should we postpone them? And a lot of uh, small parties stopped campaigning, basically, because they could not imagine that election would, would take place in, in that context. Um, so we had a lot of uh, a series of declaration speeches from the president saying that the situation is very terrible in France, that we should like stay at home and be very careful because there is a, a huge uh, public health risk. And the day, so basically the day, um, the evening when the lockdown was announced, so the full one, and, and I think France is one of the countries where the lockdown has been the most, I would say, severe with a, with a very strong role of, of the police. Um, so the, the, very, the, the very day when Macron announced that uh, the lockdown will be uh, taking place was the day before uh, the election. So it was very like, uh, were in France uh, in that moment, so you you were at bar, say like bar were closing, like really at at uh, at midnight, and then you were told that you have to go to the polls the next day at eight, and and that the situ the situation is secure enough to guarantee uh, the holding of of elections. Um, so during the day, it was a very I would say uh, weird day and and weird uh, feelings. Um, basically, uh, most of the uh, polling stations were unprepared uh, for welcoming people, especially, I mean, you have to imagine uh, 36,000 uh, uh, cities or villages, you have a lot of them are so small that they can't have access to any, you know, hygiene facilities it was like really difficult for them to, to organize uh, the election. And um, photos were posted on the, on the social media showing like, really the bad level of preparedness of polling stations so showing people you know were queuing really really close to each other no gel nothing at all uh, so it created a lot of of stress i mean a lot of people decided not to go uh to uh, the polling station uh because of uh, because of the situation and we saw that uh, after the, the first round, because the participation uh, rate, the turnout was very low, one of the lowest, it was only 40%, 20% less than the past election. So it was, it was a kind of a blow. And just after the first um, round of the election, a huge controversy started about the role of the government in sending people uh, to the polls while the level of preparation was not uh, adequate enough. Um, one of the, I would say, biggest political crises was then the, was uh, when the former Ministry of Health, uh, who had to resign to compete in Paris as a as a as a as a uh, yeah candidate to uh, to um, to the to, to become the, the the mayor of Paris, said that she did warn the government several times that the situation was. Uh, uh, not adequate, and that uh, the government put in danger the, the life of the people by sending them to the to the polls. So this is how it um, it started, and uh, I would say 15 days after the first round of the election, um, some so so the death of close to six people uh, were, was announced because they were like the president of the polling station. So a lot of you know doubts were raised about actually the, the, the willingness, I would say, of the French government to protect uh, the people working in the polling station, volunteering in the polling stations. Uh, so they were called martyr of democracy, which is quite of a strong um, word and quite of a strong uh, sentence. 
And as of now, so uh, the, the the situation is is a bit complicated because a lot of uh, a lot of mayors were reappointed after the first uh, round, which is quite rare. And uh, th these are not expected, uh, I would say, mayors. So some very contested mayors were reappointed in a context where the turnout was very very low. So it, it raises doubts about actually the quality of the of the electoral process. Uh, but still, the decision was taken to validate the results of the first round and to organize the next round at the end of June. So on the 28th of June, there will be the second round of the election. And the situation is, of course, a bit, uh, a bit complicated because a lot of uh, lists and citizens' lists are actually contesting the result of the first round, saying that uh, it was actually a strategy from the government to avoid any big contestation to continue with the electoral process, why nothing was uh, really in place to, to guarantee the safety of, of the people on the ground. So this is a bit the situation where we are uh, caught in. We did expect that uh, the turnout will uh, uh, benefit um, parties who represent people who don't necessarily vote. So young people or, you know, uh, in France, it was like, I, I think it's it's quite common in Europe, but elder people vote more, of course, uh, than, than, than younger people. But it's not the case, uh, because basically it's the uh, party on the right wing of the political spectrum who uh, won the most uh, seats in the uh, in the municipal election. So this is a bit the situation where we are at uh, right now. I must say that uh, it is uh, one of the first time where I see such a uh, such a contestation for uh, a political process. So there is a lot of uh, disappointment, a lot of um, disillusion, and an overall feeling that this was right a political coup organized by the government. So there was a willingness to continue with the election, knowing that they would not be defeated as much as uh, this could have been the case if the election would have taken place in a normal, let's say, normal conditions. So this is what a this is for the situation, I would say, in, in France. Thank you very much. Um, I, I would suggest that we continue uh, now first with um, with Achim Wölfel and uh, Matt Kvortrup so that afterwards we can uh, we can compare actually a little bit between situations. Um, so maybe I think Achim um, at Mere Demokratie, you are you are actually dealing with a lot of the same questions right now concerning the. Um, the municipal elections that will take place in North Rhine-Westphalia in, in September. Um, perhaps you could uh, explain a little bit uh, what, what you are working on at the moment and what the challenges are. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to um, give the perspective of North Rhine-Westphalia. Um, I think we have a, a couple of um, the same issues here in North Rhine-Westphalia than there are in, in France right now. Um, I did this uh, short presentation, which I'd like to share with you, um, probably to, to make it easier for all of us to follow. Um, so the screen sharing is deactivated. Could, could you activate it for me? I just did. Um, you should be allowed to. Ah, no, it's working. Yeah. Okay. Then I will do that in a second. Um, Okay. Okay. I hope you can see it now. Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, okay, then I will start the presentation. Uh, elections and times of Corona. Um, the situation we have uh, here in North Rhine Westphalia. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, yeah, the German state or the federal system of Germany. North Rhine-Westphalia is uh, one of the German Bundesländer. Um, actually, the biggest one uh, regarding the population, uh, nearly 18 million people live in North Rhine-Westphalia. Um, uh, yeah, it's a strong in, in industrial region and uh, a lot of things happening here in a political sense. Uh, have uh, have some influence on what's happening on the national level. So uh, other Bundesländer and the national level are looking at North Rhine-Westphalia, uh, what's going on here with the election. Um, 
yeah, the situation is we have uh, our local or municipal um, election on 13th September 2020. And we will vote our majors, our, um, all the representatives of um, the communities, of the cities, of the districts. We will uh, vote our um, county councils. And plus we will vote the like councils for um, integration issues. So a couple of things will be voted on this date. And yeah, this election is every five years and um, the date is fixed, so um, our government uh, was thinking about yeah, postponing the election um, because of Corona, but um, now it's said we can't do that because of several uh, reasons. And so we have local elections on 13th September 2020, and the problem is um, can fair and safe elections be guaranteed in times of Corona? There are a lot of measurements uh, um, here in North Rhine Westphalia uh, in order to tackle the issues of Corona, like to stop Corona, and they make it very difficult to guarantee um, like normal elections. And our answer is that the answer of Mehr Demokratie is uh, yes, probably we can guarantee safe and, and fair elections, uh, but uh, we have to adjust the framework conditions of these elections. So we, we can't postpone the election, we can't cancel the election, we, we don't want to cancel the election, but we can influence the framework conditions. And since we thought about it like that, uh, we formulated a paper and wrote down 10 uh, important points in our perspective, which have to be guaranteed in order to have uh, safe and fair elections in September. And yeah, since uh, this input uh, um, will provide you with our 10 demands and then we can talk about them later. So I, I'll try to make it short and brief. Um, we divided the election process since the local elections are not uh, only a date, but they are an election process because parties have to prepare already now. Um, they have to, uh, yeah, they have to hand in signatures if they never participated in those elections, um, like in order to show that they are serious parties and that they are, um, that they have at least a minimum of supporters. Um, all those parties who want to participate in the election, they have to uh, hand in lists with the candidates and those lists have to be fixed uh, until some date. So there are a lot of things which have to be done in advance, starting now. Um, so we, we divided the election process into three phases and you can see them here. Like the first phase is the pre-election campaign, starting now until 15th of July. The second phase is the, the election campaign from 15th to uh, July to uh, one day before the election. And then the third phase is the, the actual election day uh, on 13th September. So um, for every phase we have three, three points uh, um, uh, we, we want to make and where we think the government sh should put emphasis on. And yeah, I just start with the first one, um, phase one appropriate and free premises for candidate assemblies. Um, yeah, since uh, uh, Corona makes it more difficult for parties to gather, to gather with a lot of people, um, uh, cities should support uh, parties as best as they can. So they should uh, uh, provide uh, free premises, they should provide appropriate premises, like big city halls and stuff like that, because cities they have access to those rooms and parties need them now. It's more difficult to find them. So that's the first point. The second point is no or less signatures for registration. Like we, I told you about this rule we have here in, in NRV that uh, parties need to gather signatures. Not a lot, but they need to, to gather them in all those districts they want to participate in the election. And our demand is to uh, significantly lower the amount of signatures they need or uh, to yeah 
to cancel this signature uh, hurdle at all. Like other, other Bundesländer in Germany uh, do not have this um, rule. So Schleswig-Holstein, for example, you do not need to uh, collect signatures to participate on an election. So it works as well. Um, that would be our second demand. Um, and the third one, financial ad for election campaigns. So uh, right now we would be in the phase where small groups, uh, parties and so on would collect money for their election campaign. And that is really difficult right now. I mean, you can, you can make uh, online events and you can um, yeah, try, to, uh, uh, try to send your messages to the people, but it's uh, way more difficult to like, really get a strong connection to, to voters and to people who would then be willing, for example, to spend money for your campaign. And since this is the case, we um, yeah, demand uh, financial aid for uh, parties. So that's the first phase. Um, the second phase uh, begins in on 15th of July. And this, we cho did choose this date because until that date, until 15th of July, uh, parties need to have had their candidate assemblies and they need to have had already uh, handed in the signatures. So that's the simple reason for this date. And yeah, in this second phase of election campaign, um, we think it would be very helpful um, to guarantee that uh, the voters are, uh, can be informed by the parties and the groups. And therefore, we'd like to, to have voting booklets um, sent automatically to all the households uh, which are eligible to vote. And in these voting booklets, I wrote down they are based on the Swiss example because in Swiss they have them when they have direct democratic uh, um, decisions like all, all the households get informed by a voting booklet where um, uh, both sides of the, um, of the vote are presented. And we think that would be very smart for NRV as well. That um, there is a small booklet, all the parties uh, who participate on the election can have one page, for example, to uh, present their demands. And then this voting booklet gets sent to all households. A second one uh, would be, again, appropriate uh, premises for events. Um, it's the same point as in phase one. Uh, it is not, uh, it's still not easy to get premises, even if you make smaller events. So there should be help from the governmental side. And the third one is a cooperation between information platforms and state. Um, this point is, uh, may, um, may be a little bit uh, vague. Um, the reason behind that is that these corporations have already uh, been done in NRV on the last election. There has been a cooperation between the um, government and an information platform called um, Abgeordnetenwatch. And through this platform, uh, people can ask questions uh, to the candidates um, running for election. And everything is, is collected there in this platform and then everyone can see it. It's a really nice tool and uh, we strongly uh, demand that this cooperation um, will, will be done again in this election now because it's more helpful than ever. So, but the general point here would be uh, voters need information because election campaigns are more difficult than normally. And then we are in the third phase already um, where we demand um, automatic sending of postal voting documents. Um, Nancy uh, uh, already um, spoke about this issue of postal voting. Um, yeah, we. we um, in Germany, it's not that difficult than it is in the United States. Really different problems here. Um, however, it's still a little problem with the voting, with the postal voting that you have to, you have to apply for it first. It's a two stages process and we think it's not really, um, it's 
it's not really convenient for voters. You, 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 first of all, you have to apply for it. Sometimes people forget to apply and then they realize, oh, I, I can't vote today, but I, uh, I would vote by post, uh, postal voting, but I forgot to apply for it. So that's a hurdle we do not need. So um, here the, the point would be, all those postal voting documents should be sent automatically to every household. Um, and uh, the best would be to send it together with the voting booklet mentioned in phase one. So it would be easy. Um, the second point here is sensibilization for the possibility of pre-election. In Germany, it's possible to uh, vote earlier than on the actual date of the election, but I I would say most people do not know about that. Um, for example, I only heard about that uh, possibility a couple of years ago uh, when I was um, helping in the election campaign, campaign of a politician. Like when I was really working with that issue, um, we were talking about it and I realized, oh, okay, you can go to your municipality uh, like one week before the election and just vote. It's absolutely no problem. You go there, it's already possible to vote. Um, but we do not uh, inform people really uh, uh, much about that possibility. So you basically, you have not only one date of uh, one day where you can vote, you have a longer phase. And that's an important information for all the voters. Um, and the, uh, uh, the third point here is voting locations remain. Um, we would strongly recommend that there's not only a pure uh, postal election um, because this was in the discussion here in North Rhine-Westphalia um, in Germany in general in the recent weeks in recent weeks like is this maybe one opportunity one option for ele elections during corona and we think that's not uh, the ideal way we, we uh, strongly emphasize still have uh, voting locations um, but uh, to secure safe voting there um, in order not to, to have uh, uh, circumstances uh, or incidents like in France where, uh, um, where it's dangerous for the people participating and facilitating uh, an election. So there again, uh, the government strongly needs to put resources in this part and um, yeah, uh, uh, look for safe and uh, big premises and premises not uh, in the not uh, remote to for example um, yeah like uh, like home for elderly people and stuff like that so this point needs to be um, guaranteed um, those are nine or nine points plus we have one uh, um, demand which is more uh, general and applies to all those three phases um, uh, we think there should be uh, a monitoring um, monitoring uh, by an in independent council, um, which is, uh, yeah, in this council there are experts uh, um, from all different areas and they look at all those um, faces, they look at all those points and if they see problems at any point, at any time of the election process, uh, they can make recommendations to the government. Um, yeah, those are all those uh, points, um, and that's it from my side. I'm looking forward to the discussion with you. Thank you very much, Achim. Um, I am not sure if I can stop you from sharing your screen. I ended. Um, so yes, yeah. okay. Um, yes, and then um, one country that has made a different uh, decision altogether. So in Germany, the elections are going ahead as scheduled um, in North Rhine-Westphalia. In France, they took part in part and they, uh, the second round will uh, take place postponed. Um, and in the UK, uh, the, one of the biggest uh, municipal elections that was supposed to take place in Europe um, the mayoral elections in London, they have been postponed with uh, one year. Uh, Professor Kvortrup, uh, could you explain a little bit um, how that debate has taken place and, and what the situation is now? Yeah. Sorry, just, just a minute, you're still on mute. Yeah. 
Yes, please go ahead. Me? Sorry, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, somebody was writing me on the Skype saying it's the first time I appear in public without a tie on, which for an English person, of course, is very embarrassing, but hey ho, uh, such is uh, radical times. Uh, and but, but probably my attire is probably the, the least important thing here. What is more radical is that we have effectively abolished local democracy in Britain. Um, of course, that sounds extremely radical to say it like that, uh, and it's not the first time we have uh, we have done so. Uh, the British political system, or the British constitution, if you like, is that we don't have a constitution. So, in most other countries, it would require quite a lot to um, to pass legislation to uh, effectively. Um, towards democracy. But here, because we don't have a constitution, it was relatively simple for Parliament to pass what is known as a, an order in council, uh, which is a, um, a, a, a legal instrument that has the effect of law. Uh, and the effect of that was to, to postpone the elections until the local elections until next year. Uh, so London, which is uh, probably the largest constituency in Europe, uh, I mean, you can argue that in the Netherlands, because it's one big constituency uh, that is uh, larger still, but it is, we are talking about a, uh, a city with a population the size of Belgium, who's supposed to have chosen a new mayor or a could have re-elected the current mayor, uh, but that has been uh, been cancelled uh, and or postponed until next year. Now, in the United Kingdom, um, unlike in France, for example, where you have elections every six years, we have it uh, sort of staged every year. A part of the country will have local elections, and then next year it's another part of the country, and next year uh, yet another part. So, so roughly, it's sort of uh, we, we change them ever so often. Uh, the uh, local government in Britain has been um, a number of powers have been taken away from uh, from, from local government. We used to have uh, quite strong local government. Uh, but that was gradually abolished in the 1980s. There was a thing called militant tendency, uh, especially in the north of England under the uh, Margaret Thatcher's uh, Conservative government. Uh, we, uh, we had a number of places in northern England that were quite radical. In Liverpool, for example, they uh, raised the red flag and declared that it was the People's Republic of Liverpool, and they did the same in Sheffield. And Margaret Thatcher then uh, responded to that by basically uh, limiting the very drastically the powers of local government. Uh, for example, also in London, we used to have local government back in the day, and she abolished that in uh, in an afternoon uh, when Ken Livingston, then a, a, a very left-wing firebrand, uh, became the leader of the London uh, Assembly. Now, that's sort of a bit of history for you there. We then had reintroduced local government in the late 1990s after a referendum, as it happens, uh, where we then had uh, a new elected mayor of London, which has existed ever since. We have a number of places also where we have directly elected mayors. Uh, there have to be referendums on that, and people have to, in and the current legislation to actually demand these referendums on uh, on whether they want to have an elected mayor. So so a lot of um, of local government is, is 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 quite democratic, and there have been powers uh, that have sort of a move towards uh, a, a re-strengthening of local government, especially when David Cameron was Prime Minister, uh, they passed legislation about so-called localism, which means we also have provisions for, for elements of direct democracy in local government, which we have not previously had. Uh, one of those provisions, uh, and they tend to be quite sort of conservative provisions in with with a small c if you like one of the provisions that we have now is that if you want council tax or the local taxes to increase uh, above two percent you then have to have a referendum on that um so there's like a this mechanism that requires referendum 
referendums on uh, on increases in taxation. Uh, on, in some of these referendums that have taken place, people actually voted for higher taxes. In other cases, they have not. So the process itself is neutral, but people can make up their minds. And what was very exciting, I thought, about the, the local election this year was that some people had used those local mechanisms to, in effect, have referendums on the environment. So in Warwick, which is a, a large, or large-ish, um, municipal uh, council or local council in the Midlands close to Birmingham, so pretty much in the centre of Britain, uh, they were going to have an increase in, uh, a one-off increase in local taxation to deal with the climate emergency. Uh, and um, they said we need to, we need more money to do, to do this. And in many ways that was a referendum on, on more environmental protection. So, so some of these, uh, the, 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 some of the projects that were, if you like, uh, prepared for this uh, for this election were, were quite exciting. It was almost like a laboratory of a new democratic ideas. So uh, from a sort of selfish point of view, as somebody who's very interested in new mechanisms of direct democracy and democratic participation, this year is, uh, it's very sad that we don't have this because many of these innovative things that we have not seen before in Britain are now not taking place. And it is unlikely that some of those will take place next year because it, it's as if we sort of missed the boat, as we say here. So, so, um, so again, that's sort of the selfish thing because I've been involved in some of these referendums on, uh, on the environment and using the mechanism to the full. Now, what is probably more concerning now is that, um, is that we effectively have postponed democracy. And there are a number of decisions that are really, really quite crucial. So, for example, education is a matter that is largely dealt with by local government. Uh, one of the things that has happened in London is that there used to be a provision whereby people who were not so rich, uh, typically working class people, children could travel for free on the train. Uh, then during, when we then had the schools were coming back, uh, and which has happened yesterday, uh, the Labour Party was opposed to, to reopening the schools. So uh, Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, then said, well, if you're op reopening the school, we will take away the funding that allows people to send their kids for free by uh, on the trains. So, um, though I'm, uh, I don't want to criticise Mr. Khan, who's doing a, a very good job, it has become sort of party political, and there are very uh, considerable uh, policy changes that are taking place, have taken place, and it's sort of they're allowing it to happen, if you like, uh, under the. Um, under the pretext of we couldn't possibly go out to vote. Uh, the idea of postal voting uh, has not even been considered here. Uh, it has to be said that we've had a number of cases uh, uh, in in the United Kingdom of people who have abused postal voting. Uh, there was a case in Birmingham, as it happens, where a judge uh, described how postal voting was fit for a banana, or not even fit for a banana republic, quote unquote. We've also had in some boroughs of London where people uh, uh, were, were paid to vote in a particular way. There have actually been prosecutions. So unlike in, for example, America, where there's been uh, virtually no voter fraud, we have actually had a number of cases here in Britain uh, with voter fraud. Uh, so for that reason, perhaps uh, we have not really wanted to um, to experiment under these circumstances with postal voting, though of course it is possible to do it a, in a in a legitimate way. Uh, I thought it was very interesting to to hear the uh, the discussions earlier and sort of the contrast with with America. And I know that. Uh, Oh, some of our American friends are no longer with us, but it sort of appears to me that, uh, you know, America is gerrymandering and, and, and using all these tricks to make sure that people, uh, or basically dirty tricks to make sure that you win elections. It's sort of, um, you know, it, 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 again, I don't want to criticize other countries, but it, it does not look good. Uh, and then when I looked to, to Germany, I was very impressed by the presentation. I listened carefully to what was said about France. Uh, and I thought that is a completely different debate there. And when I suppose I have to consider where we are now, uh, 
and I, when I've spoken to people, I fear we are probably slipping more towards the American end of things. Uh, I was talking to a German colleague of mine. I was complaining the other day about, uh, well, basically the lockdown. And the response to that was in German, erste Weltprobleme, erste Weltprobleme, so first world problems. And, and, and don't you worry. But I think when we're talking about democracy, Britain in many ways is in a, in, in a, in a, at a stage where, where we're not really like the first world country. We're probably the first country in the world to have, um, apart from America, I suppose, to have mass-based elections. We've had uh, direct uh, elections of, of one kind or another to a national assembly since uh, 1832. Uh, and Britain likes to talk about the parliament as being the mother of all parliaments. Uh, and uh, it is as if uh, the mother of all parliaments has had a sort of a, a stepmotherly approach to democracy as of late. Again, I should put this into perspective and to say that during emergencies, it is quite common for Britain to, uh, to go down this route. While America had uh, general elections all throughout the Second World War, uh, we basically did the same. We also uh, postponed democracy uh, from the beginning of the, first, of the Second World War to the end of the First World War. So there's a precedent for that, uh, but I think that uh, one sin does not justify another. I think there should be a way of, uh, of giving people the right to vote. Uh, and to quote Joseph, um, Keith Joseph, a former minister uh, in Britain, if you give people responsibility, they become responsible. If you take responsibility away from people, they become irresponsible. Uh, and democratically speaking, responsibility has been taken away from many British people. Um, and I'm very concerned about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Raman, I believe you will facilitate now the, the discussion. Uh, we don't have yes, a lot yes. of time left. But we don't have very much time left, but I just saw that Eugenie is also here in this, in this round. And um, Eugenie, um, as much as I know, in Russia is, there was supposed to be a referendum on the constitution where Putin wanted to, to get the constitution changed. So maybe you can, if you want to, you can give a short, brief insight. So what is the situation with this referendum in Russia? What is the official uh, policy which is Putin driving there? Postponing? I think it should have taken the 22nd of April and now was postponed. What is now the situation? Maybe a short brief. Yeah, uh, just just a small one. First of all, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me here. You just catch me on the run, but I managed to stand up for, for the whole session. Uh, a few words about the upcoming referendum in Russia. Well, it's just actually just one word. It's a, it's a disaster from the both standpoints, from the standpoint of the democracy democracy values and the standpoint from epidemiology uh, point of view. So just brief brief information about this referendum. Uh, I don't want to call it a referendum because it's not. It's more like a plebiscite, but even the plebiscite is uh, just really great word for the thing that is going to happen. Uh, just to, to give you an understanding what kind of uh, referendum we're going to have, it's the change in constitution. And a few few uh, sentences that we would like that Vladimir Putin is would like to introduce in this constitution is like first of all we uh, we forbid gay marriages that will be in our constitution. Second of all, uh, Russia is the country that oversee by God that will be also in our constitution. Also, there will be information like uh, Russia is the winner of World War Two is the only and the one winner and stuff like this. But the more important there will be in, in the very end of the discussion of the changes in the constitution, there were added uh, the remark that Vladimir Putin can stay in charge up to 2036. That will be a change in the constitution by the changing just one word, basically they let, uh, let Vladimir Putin to rule more than 16 years from now. All right, uh, they planned this for April, but thank God they decided to postpone it. And by the way, we have a we have electoral cycle that uh, we expect to, to having normal elections in spring and autumn, and the spring campaign was canceled. It's more like uh, municipal elections in few regions in Russia, they was canceled. By, but 
those uh, con this constitution some sort of, some sort of reform it was postponed for uh, for summer and yesterday it became official the f the voting was starting 25th of june so basically our central election commission offering people just to vote uh, it's it's literally i saw the i saw the ballot are you do you agree with the changes in constitution in, in the constitution yes and no that's all no discussion no cheering for yay nay nothing like that just uh, do you agree that Vladimir Putin will stay in charge for 2036? That's actually what people have been going to be to be asking. Uh, and uh, into, uh, the election will will happen. The referendum actually will happen in 30 uh, in 25 25th of June, like 20 days basically from now. The epidemiology situation in Russia is just awful. We're like third country on the from the top that experiencing up to 10 thousand new cases each day and just imagine i hope the turnout will be lower than in presidential election i think the turnout will be around 30 around 30 percent but it's 30 million people that will go to the polling station interact somehow with the poll polling station workers uh the old they those people are they really quite old it's like 55 plus age so we just going to have a disaster from from the side of from the standpoint of the rise of the virus in Russia, but that's kind of fun. In 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 the sake of uh, people are so tired of this bullshit from from the from the standpoint of the of our government, the, the government trying to persuade us uh, and changing the constitution that way. So uh, I saw the polls. Today's polls that conducted by the one of the German funds, and it's it it seems like only 40% of the whole Russian population support the the those changes in the constitution because everybody understands everything. It's not like we're going to do something that's necessary for our country. We just we just keeping Vladimir Putin in charge for the next 16 years. So I'm really curious, and I'm really I'm go, I'm, I'm I want to be entertained in uh, everything that's coming is, go, is going to happen in 25th up to 1st of July. And by the way, it will be seven days. The 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 voting will happen not just one day because the voting turnout will be just really low, but seven days. And uh, yeah, but one one more thing that I would like to add here is uh, uh, despite all this weirdness and we, this really weird process. There are a lot of people in government and central election commission that well educated and looking into the future. And there was uh, there were there was passed a bill recently about the online voting. You know, I'm cheering for online voting a lot for uh, for transparent and verifiable E to E like end to end verifiability process in the in the voting. And uh, there will be during this uh, plebiscite there will be run a, an uh, some sort of pilot in uh, Moscow and two more cities in Moscow, St. Petersburg and uh, Nizhny Novgorod. And uh, th there will be like uh, free access to online voting from the devices and stuff like this. And I evaluated the system. We actually, uh, me and my team, we we make a contribu made a comp contribution in the system. And I hope that this really embarrassing plebiscite will, out will bring us in the will show us the ability to you know to just we will pilot the online elections during uh, during this plebiscite and we will see if it will be used in the future campaign in 2021 when we're going to have a parliament election yeah thank you very much Eugenie. yeah well i think that is now a very good i would say international overview the only challenge is now that we don't have very much time to discuss anymore all this insight we have um, so, um, I think one, one question was, um, Achim, um, your presentation, I suppose you can share it because I think um, at least the, the, this was a feedback from Matt and for others. And I think you, you really have some good points and one idea could really be a little bit to, to, you know, to collect further points. I, I don't know if Democracy International is interested in this kind of, for example, this also all this question of e-voting, you know, and, and you know, 
um, voting by mail or the experiences from France. So at least we can have like a, how say, like a menu, you know, where each of us can uh, like pick the proposals um, we want to send our to our own municipalities or our governments and so on. So we can share a little bit ideas. How can elections now be, I'll say, put into practice? Yeah, Clara, you, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thanks a lot for very inspiring uh, insights. And uh, I, I really second the point on, on um, e-voting because well, we should be careful because I saw in the chat messages saying, well, it's unfair in any case to postpone election. Election should take place. The, the challenge I see, I mean, from the French perspective is that um, continuing with the election without any form of preparation were actually an, an exceptional mean of suppressing voters. Like it was, it was, you know, then you can say, well, I'm a strong defender of democracy. I want things to take place, but at the same time, you're not putting in place any conditions for the situation to really be uh, good on the ground. So it puts, I think it puts us as democra like democracy activists in a kind of weird situation where we have to push for election, but at the same time, how they will be implemented does not depend on us, unless we say e-voting now, because this is how it should, you know, uh, it should happen. And uh, looking at the French case, I think it could have been perfectly possible to do e-voting and vote per mail no, no debate about that, but it was not an option on the table at all because it was not in the interest of, of the politician in place. So this is what is a bit, I think, tricky in that whole debate is that we have to not only support that election should take place, also because I think in like this pandemic has shown that a lot of responsibilities are exercised at the local level. So these politicians have to be held accountable of the choices they made because they were left with a lot of responsibility. But it's not, you know, I, I don't think it's easy to say, well, it's either or, right? If election take place, that's good in any case. What we see from France is that it can be super shitty, uh, like bad elections can, can be really like, really shitty, yeah. Yeah, I, I had several times um, the impression that maybe the real discussion we are currently are facing is not and when, in a certain sense, you know, to make the election, meaning postponing or not postponing, or how we should do it by mail or by online and so on, um, but really for what at all. I, I have sometimes the impression, you know, that um, at least many people have the impression that it's very good to have a strong government which is now running in this crisis. And we know from history that um, a crisis, a war or a pandemic or anything like this, is normally the, the, the hour of the of the government when where they can show you the you know um, the force and where in certain sense um, urging uh, to have an election is almost like being a traitor to your government and um, uh, we are fortunately in Germany that we have uh, this year not very much important elections and especially not, none on the federal level will be next year. Um, but I think that's really a, a crucial question. How can elections, you know, be, be, be done in a fair way under any kind of circumstances? Because we all know we are living in a time where crises are really easy to produce also. Not, well, you know, Corona is not produced, but governments also can produce crises. I grew up in Latin America where, for example, the... Um, was common also to make some kind of war or war intervention if you want to distract from your problem. So, um, Matt, you have to. Okay, it is difficult. Uh, just you mentioned, uh, Robin, uh, Latin America, and I can see uh, uh, that we have uh, also. Um, uh, people from Latin America, and I was wondering, because we don't hear much about it here, how the situation is in Mexico, uh, because, uh, you know, it seems that in, in most of the focus when it comes to Latin America has been on Brazil, uh, and of course the, the president there is in complete denial uh, and fighting against it. But I understand that AMLO in Mexico has also been sort of on denial. I'm just wondering what, what the situation is 
both by, you know, in, in, in overall democratically speaking in, in Mexico at the moment, at this uh, period of time, if anyone uh, has any insights into that. I can give you a brief, brief, brief answer to that because we actually had a whole session on, on Mexico last, uh, last Democracy Jam. But uh, so we postponed uh, this year's elections. We still don't have a date, but we know that they have to happen before September. So these are local elections for two mayors and local congresses in two states in Mexico. And uh, we are still waiting to see what will happen with next year's elections. So next year we have the midterm election in uh, June, July um, for Congress. Uh, so we're still waiting to see what will happen with that. So like the 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 most uh, probable thing is that it will be held normally, but we still don't know. Uh, and as you all know, our president is not being very cautious about the, the, the sanitary emergency. So he actually just yesterday, he started traveling the country again. He's not wearing a mouth cover of any kind. Uh, we just reached 10,000 dead uh, people because of COVID and um, our, our president's uh, discourse is that we already have flattened the curve, which is not true because the curve keeps going up and up. So that is pretty much the situation right now. Okay, we have still four minutes left. So maybe first, thank you very much, Greta. Other, other, I would say, um, countries who want to join, a little bit giving an insight about the, 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 pro, the problem, um, but maybe also about solutions. If not, well, um, and, and, and the questions. You know, I am always happy to offer solutions because we have them. <laughs> so, uh, so. <laughs> you already presented it several times here, but. Uh, you, well, you know, the problem with, you know, democracy is people actually have to participate in it. And that's exactly what we offer. We offer an environment for people to actually really do democracy. So I invite every one of you to join us in our citizen assemblies where people actually come together to del deliberate solutions and then organize to demonstrate what are the most strongly solutions supported by the people. And then to create politicians who are going to implement those solutions, because if they don't, we will replace them because we're making a whole list of politicians who are ready to, well, step up. So uh, more information is in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Cesare. Okay. Okay, well, I, I think we really have say, touched quite a lot of a very important questions today. And especially, you know, we have in, in German, you say to give away your vote when you go um, voting, you know, seine Stimme abgeben, it's to go away, to give away, you know. And so this is also a little bit like very symbolically because, um, you know, we, if, we, if we're speaking for democracy, in reality, we should be speaking on, you know, how not only every four or five or six years um, our voice is important, but uh, how in every important de um, decision um, the voice of the people should be heard. And so um, if... Corona now is even, uh, as I used or misused um, to, sh you know, quieten um, the voice of the people even more, then this is really like, I'll say, um, maybe going under, under a critical level of deliberation, where really at the end democracy maybe is, 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 is weakened so much that it will be very difficult um, to be part of the solution. As, as you know, and as a, we in the Academy of Learning Democracy, we, um, since several years, we work on how can we develop a democratic system which is in certain self modernizing itself, which is trying to, to, to learn faster um, than the challenges arise. And especially when it comes to Corona and after Corona challenges, I think. Um, democracy is, is, is the best answer because in, um, a democratic system is the highest um, and best system to how say um, you know, activate the um, co-creative power of the people. So I thank you very much for um, being part of this democracy jam today about elections. 
And um, Caroline from Democracy International, um, I suppose that you are already, how to say, thinking about the next topic and, um, and when we will meet um, next time again. So I give back to Caroline. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I, I really want to thank especially also our speakers, uh, Nancy, she's not here anymore, but also Achim and Clara and Matt um, for sharing these um, these really interesting views and uh, also our guest appearances from Eugenie and, and Greta. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's really interesting to hear all of these different experiences from different countries and, and I really wish we had more time to discuss. Um, and I would really like to invite everybody uh, who took part in this call or uh, who's watching this on social media um, to send us sort of um, conclusions um, or ideas like how um, what can we do now how can we take the lessons from this experience um, and and really make our democracies more resilient um, for the future um, yes uh, we uh, we do plan on continuing these uh, webinars or democracy jams um, and so we this is uh, once again an invitation to uh, please send us topics if uh, if you have something that um, that you would like to discuss and um, that that you would like to see discussed here um, that's related to democracy and corona and and how we handle this health crisis uh, then please do let us know um, and then i think we are now one minute over time i'm very sorry uh, thank you all very much for um, <laughs> for joining us and i hope to see you very soon